Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Year in Review. This is a day we talk about recent data sets in the management of multiple myeloma. We have a great faculty today, Dr. Joseph McHale from the Translational Genomics Research Institute and City of Hope Cancer Center in Phoenix, and Dr. Ajay Nuka from the Winship Cancer Institute at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta. As always, uh, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by our faculty, just type them into the chat room. We'll get to them, as many of these uh, as we can. As always, we have a brief one-minute survey at the beginning and end of this exercise. If you take it, you'll get a lot more out of this meeting. We know a lot of people end up listening to our webinars. If you're into audio programs, check out our Oncology Today podcast series, including a recent program with Dr. Krishnan on one BCMA directed therapies. Uh, this is part of our uh, year in review uh, series that we do every January. Uh, tomorrow we'll continue uh, with another program on targeted therapy of non-small cell lung cancer. So much there to talk about, hard to even get through in an hour. Uh, we're about to head out to San Francisco to the GI Cancer Symposium. We'll be doing three symposia out there. If you're in the San Francisco area, drop one in. For everybody else, so we'll be doing this uh, online as well. So the next Wednesday, uh, we have a great faculty talking about uh, colorectal cancer. Thursday, gastroesophageal cancer. And Friday, have had a biliary cancer. So much going on there. We'll be presenting a bunch of video cases from docs in practice. And then uh, January 24th, uh, we'll be uh, reviewing what's been going on in the past year with gynecologic oncology, PARP inhibitors in ovarian cancer, and more. But today we're here to talk about multiple myeloma. And as we do in this series, I met with both of our faculty over the last couple of weeks and recorded an in-depth presentation uh, that we're gonna select some papers for to discuss. But uh, I met with both of the faculty and we talked about a lot of papers, a lot of papers from the ASH meeting. Dr. McHale uh, reviewed a bunch of papers related to upfront treatment and Dr. Nuka, papers in relapse disease and new uh, strategies, including bispecifics and CAR-T. So we're gonna kind of dip into that whole thing uh, over the next hour. But before we uh, start, I just wanted to get the faculty's take. We actually started talking about this over the last uh, 20 minutes in the faculty rehearsal. So it's kind of a debate we started, we're gonna continue, which is you know, very dramatic, uh, Joe. We've had two drugs recently that were approved, that people out in practice were using, getting used to using, and all of a sudden they're pulled off the market from the FDA. We'll see whether they're even gonna come back. Uh, so, and here, here are the press releases, uh, just uh, end of November and then the beginning of December. Uh, any thoughts about this development? I hear docs, you know, who've got patients on belantamab doing well, they're arranging to get the drug, but they're kind of trying to understand why a drug that you know, has a pretty good response rate and maybe 30, 35% is not gonna be available anymore. What's your uh, take on it? What do you think, uh, how, does, how does this feel to you, Joe? Oh, thanks, Neil. It's always great to be with you, my friend. It's a it's a pleasure. Um, well, I think starting with belantamab, I think uh, as we were discussing a little bit before, I, I don't think this is the end of belantamab. I, I, we saw such an impressive, as you mentioned, single agent response. Um, the confirmatory trial did not meet its endpoint, but there are other trials ongoing. And for those clinicians who are taking care of patients right now with belantamab, of course, they're registered in a REMS program. There is an opportunity actually to continue the drug, and frankly, actually, Neil, to introduce new patients to the drug through an expanded access program. Now that requires some communication with the company. There has to be IRB approval either through an individual IND or a larger expanded access program um, uh, consent. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it can be done. Obviously, it takes more time. It's a little bit more challenging. There are some hoops to jump through. But we do see so many patients benefit from this drug. And interesting, a lot of them are not very frequently getting treated um, because the drug continues its response over long period of time, but they're still in response. So I do think we haven't heard the end of the belantamab story. When it comes to melflunflufenamide or melflufen, uh, I still think that's a little bit up in the air. It's tough to say. That trial was really quite uh, convincing that there were some concerns about this drug. It may be beneficial in certain subsets, but we would need a lot more data for it to make a resurgence. 
So, AJ, I'm curious about your thoughts on this. You know, I don't try to figure out the FDA. I know they have a tough job to do. There's a lot of other issues in oncology in terms of cost, et cetera. We tend to focus on, you know, the clinical science. But from that point of view, I guess one of the issues is, is it reasonable uh, to, you know, use an agent, a new agent, based on a single-arm trial, or do you need randomized data? Clearly, and very, very rare, you know, we're talking tomorrow about lung cancer, some of these mutations, you know, are very rare, and you're never going to do a randomized study on them. But, you know, relapse myeloma, there are quite a few patients. Any thoughts, AJ? Uh, AJ, you know, you have a lot of people, you've got patients on Valentina that seem to be benefiting. Uh, what about the role of uh, patient-reported outcomes? We're seeing more of that put into the design of trials. Do you feel better if not only do you see activity, you know, responses, uh, you know, objective evidence, but also patient-reported patients telling you they feel better and, and reported in a scientific way? Any thoughts, AJ? Thanks for having me, Neil. That's a packed question. So the way that the current process goes on with the drug development is it's not foolproof, but it is a good way for us to get the drugs is under the accelerated approval programs. So if you take the example of daratumumab, it got approved as a single agent, single agent based on the single agent activity of less than 30%. You take the example of belantumab, the same exact 31% or so, selinexor, but daratumumab based on the confirmatory trials that followed has attained the approval. Similarly, selinex attained a full approval based on the confirmatory trials as well. So the process works. So we're able to get the drug earlier to the patients. So what could be tweaked a little bit are the confirmatory trials. It's not that belantumab does not have activity. It has great activity, and we, we all have examples of patients that continue to continue to derive those benefits in the long run. So the pre-specified endpoints were the ones that were not met. The study design has so much of an importance that needed to be really taken into consideration when, when, these tri when the confirmatory trials are designed. And you bring in a great point in terms of how to incorporate the, the PROs, the patient-related outcomes, into these trials. So it is not just the efficacy that you're looking at, if you're looking at another bar comparing to a, another competitor, but how to incorporate those PROs into this approval process. And even that will help us to deliver the drugs based on the PROs as well. So Joe, I was kind of flashing back. There used to be a thing called twist, I think in breast cancer, time without symptoms or something like that. You know, I guess it was the first attempt to really look at patient reported outcomes. I put in another uh, point here related to this, uh, and I was thinking about it a lot when I was, when, when Ajay was doing his presentation on bi by specifics, because he was saying, you know, there's a, a concern about increased risk of infection. And, you know, I hear, I've heard a bunch of other myeloma people mention that, and, you know, I couldn't really look at the numbers and get the feel for it, but just talking to him, it was almost I had to interpret how he felt about it. And I got the feeling it was a pretty significant problem. So, and, but, you know, you got maybe by specific going to come down to a community level fairly soon. How do you figure out when you only have one arm data what the magnitude of a problem is like, for example, secondary infections, Joe? Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think it's incumbent on us. And thankfully, uh, because we have in one way, sadly been reporting infections in myeloma since, you know, the start of myeloma, uh, we're, 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 we're good at grading those infections and reporting them. But I think part of the strategy has to not just look at the wonderful sticker shock of the response rates of these, but really look at the infections. And in particular, Neil, what may be different here with the bispecifics as they move into the community is that historically in myeloma, as was sadly confirmed during COVID, people's greatest risk of infection was when their disease was the most active. Now, some of the work actually out of Emory, uh, Ajay, in your center was has been so helpful in helping us understand this, that the immune dysfunction of having active myeloma puts you at risk of infection. The worrisome feature now is we're seeing these people in deep, deep responses and yet developing significant infections because we're probably over beating down their T cells. Um, so I think there's going to be an evolution, Neil. Like we're not, we, we, we don't use almost any drug now the way it first came out in myeloma, 
right? Bortezomib was IV twice weekly. Carfilzomib was twice weekly. Uh, um, uh, Daratumumab was IV. They've all gone through this evolution that always increased their efficacy and reduced their toxicity. I think that's going to happen here. But your point is very well taken. In a single arm study, it's hard to know because they're typically smaller numbers. Um, and during COVID and other things, it's hard to assess that infection. But I would say that we have to keep infection risk high on our radars as we look go forward with these newer treatments because it's devastating to see a patient with heavily relapsed myeloma get this amazing response and then tragically die of a rare infection. Um, we, we really want to find ways around that. So final question about this, RJ, is specifically the issue of COVID. It seems like so long ago, all, all we talked about was COVID, but it was really only obviously just a couple of years ago. Is, is, do you look upon COVID differently than other viral infections? Um, and particularly as it relates to therapies being used in myeloma, is it more of a risk than you know other types of infections? And uh, how does it relate to the type of therapy? For example, I've heard people say, you see more COVID with bispecifics. So it's it's a, I would put it in a in a slightly different way. The immune responses that patients get from the vaccinations are blunted or impaired with specific myeloma treatments. So we had shown from from our institution that daratumumab can impair these induction of these immune responses. So what we have routinely talked to the patients and got these patients vaccinated with the boosters. As, as we go on with increasing those layers of protection and minimizing the, minimizing the risk of having the COVID is the best way to, to deal with in any such scenario. All right, well, it's time for some rock and roll. Let's go through as many papers as we can. And of course, we're gonna start out with the big paper of the year. Joe actually did the discussion this in the plenary session of the ASCO meeting, the determination trial, which had an impressive uh, uh, effect on PFS, but no effect on overall survival. And uh, Joe went through these data in his talk. There were a couple of factors, a couple of things that we talked about that I kind of didn't really pick up the magnitude of, and I just want to point out, uh, one is the issue of the higher risk patient, uh, Jay, and you see here a greater impact uh, on high risk patients than standard risk patients. So first of all, Ajay, what were your thoughts about determination? Does it change the way you're presenting transplant as an option to patients? And are you more likely to think about it in a high-risk patient? So you asked two great questions. So number one, what, is the, what are the take-home messages for me from determination? Number one, transplant still has a role. It met the primary endpoint with a PFS difference of 21 months favoring the transplant arm. Now, if you tease out who are the patients that got benefited, benefited the most, you can clearly see the patients who have high risk got benefited from, from, from transplant. And from, for the standard risk patients, they still got benefited from the transplant, but you have an option of delaying for a later time based on what you saw from, uh, from the overall survival uh, across the board. Joe, again, you did the discussion, so you were among the first people to really be able to think through the data. Again, how's it approached, uh, how's it changed, if at all, the way you approach patients? You know, we were just talking about, you know, do you need a randomized trial that shows a survival benefit? And hey, I don't see it here. And it's not like it's a very easy therapy. Uh, I kind of wonder whether there should have been a stronger reaction. You know, I think people are saying, oh, all the docs and practitioners saying, well, I send the patient to a transplanter and see what they have to say. But, I mean, should we be recommending uh, upfront transplant, Joe, in a patient with standard risk? It's, it's a great question, and, and that's why it divided, you know, being before I was a discussant, I felt like I was, I was like running for office. I had like, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats all calling me, <laughs> telling me, you, you're going to say transplant's good, right? Oh, you're going to say we don't need transplant, right? I mean, like, I was trying to be the most independent I could be, Neil. But, but you know, joking aside, I think the magnitude of the PFS difference is significant, right? Because we all talk about that. That was the primary endpoint of the study. But pragmatically, in the long run, the fact that there wasn't an overall survival advantage does worry me to a little to 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 a certain extent especially when we see that really only 
uh, 28% of people who didn't get the transplant up front got it later, unlike the French trial where 80% of them did. So that study was really, if you will, early versus delayed transplant. And, and, and in that way, you could argue it's okay that there's no overall survival difference. So I would have expected more. The other point I really want to make here, and again, I'm not trying to be ageist or exclusionary, but I just came from my clinic, Neil, and I had a patient come in with these curves for determination to ask about her mother who we're considering a transplant for but she's 74 years old. Every patient in this trial was 65 years and younger. So if we couldn't demonstrate that benefit then, because as you know, as we get older, respectfully, it's harder for us to show an overall survival benefit, but even in this younger population to demonstrate that. I think the only thing it changes for me is that it is still a very legitimate option I'm very comfortable delaying transplant in standard risk patients. And often I'm just giving people permission to not have a transplant when they're over the age of 65 and I know they're going to have significant toxicities through it. Maybe what's pushing me a little bit though is in that higher risk patient who is close to the age of 65. And again, it's not about age, it's about their performance status and comorbidities and so on. Um, I may be a little bit more keen to proceed with transplant because delaying it may be a problem. They may not be able to get it later or tolerate it later. So, so that may be the gentle nudge, but I think it's just a reassurance that transplant, as I joked in my, um, in my commentary, just like any other drug, transplantamab or transplantamib or transplantamide, whatever you want to call it. I mean, at the end of the day, it is just one drug of melphalan, um, that it should be looked at as an option and not absolutely the default. And of course, you know, we're talking about patient uh, uh, reported outcomes, patient involvement in decision, you know, anytime in oncology, you can invite the patient to participate and actually make the decision. Uh, Jay, I, sometimes I think that some of these trials are almost like the Talmud, the more you read it, the more you see it. But I know I, when the, it was first presented, I was kind of wondering and concerned a little bit when you're looking at more in terms of second cancers. So overall, you know, there is an increase in second cancers, but what was most striking was the, uh, the fact that in the transplant group, there were 10 people with AML and MDS and in the non-transplant zero. And actually I did a program yesterday uh, with Dr. Richard Stone from Dana-Farber, the AML doc. And I said, is there any reason that patients in this, this type of transplant should have a higher risk of AML or MDS than other people getting a transplant, because I don't know, it seems, I don't know, 10 versus zero, kind of interesting. And Ajay, he brought up a very interesting point, which is the post-transplant lenalidomide, which of course, you know, is associated with some modest increase of second cancers. So I'm just kind of curious so what your thoughts are, Ajay, about this specific finding, how much of a concern? So it is not surprising for me to see this number. So this is RVD with transplant followed by land maintenance. we would seen the secondary primary malignancies at a rate of around 3%, uh, even for, from the earlier trials, Phil McCarthy's trial initially, going on to the MRC11 trial, all of those who used maintenance at a later time had reported the secondary primary malignancies. So what this trial had shown was clearly the usage of lenalidomide post-transplant increases the risk of AML. But if you look at the prior row on, on, the, on the same one, the risk of ALL is increased in those patients that did not receive a transplant. So are we saying the transplant is protective of ALL? So it's a, it's a give and take when you, when, when you, when you look, at, uh, look at both these scenarios, the risk of ALL is significantly higher among patients that, that did not receive uh, the transplant. So the bottom line is, yes, the patient has to understand that this is an expected outcome and the other 97% of the patients do not have those secondary primary malignancies. Joe, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think um, there's lots of ways to try and carve this. I think the simple way to say is, yes, transplant does contribute. Lenalidomide has a risk in and of itself, but transplant does increase that risk of a second primary. And we've known that even before we gave lenalidomide maintenance. And we see it in different realms, often in GU malignancies and in uh, uh, MDS-AML situations. It has to remind us, though, that the baseline 
no matter what someone gets in terms of treatment during their myeloma journey, sadly, there's about a four to five percent risk of a second cancer, even independent, if you will, or agnostic to whatever therapy someone has. And that's, you know, related to underlying genetics, yes, to some treatment, but also to the, what I call phenomena of incidentaloma, right? These people are being followed more closely and we find things uh, that we may not have found before. I think we've historically said, because there's an overall survival advantage associated with lenalidomide maintenance, it sort of outweighs the potential risk. I think what it does, as you said, so important to have that conversation with the patient, those open lines of communication need to be there. And we have to remember after a transplant or even just on lenalidomide prolonged therapy, are patients getting their mammograms and their colonoscopies, their PSA check, their, their, you know, are they reporting blood in their urine and their stool? Are we checking their CBCs regularly? Are you noticing that the MCV is climbing or the hemoglobin is dropping out of keeping with the myeloma? Uh, those are the kinds of things that are going to help us capture these a little bit earlier. Uh, and sadly, they're inevitably to happen in a percentage of patients. Uh, but hopefully, Hopefully with time, my goal ultimately is that we don't have people on continuous therapy because we're going to have such great immune therapies early on, and hopefully that'll have the added benefit of reducing those second primary malignancies. So I really recommend that you check out the two talks that are part of this uh, program. And Josie has these, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Joe uh, summaries uh, where he, you know, goes through. There's a lot of the points you went through in the original discussion. Let's go through a bunch of other papers. Uh, OJ, we saw uh, an update of the uh, of the Griffin study, uh, Dara uh, uh, of RVD. We're hearing a lot of people uh, doing this uh, outside of clinical trial right now. Uh, the data continues to uh, look great. Interesting, uh, Joe pointed out, I didn't realize, I didn't, you know, actually, I guess this is a randomized phase two, uh, but uh, Curious uh, what your thought is nowadays, Ajay, about using uh, quadruplet therapy. Uh, I know, you know, of course, we worked with Sagar a few weeks ago, and he's, he's always been very pro uh, quadruple therapy. What are the situations uh, right now where you're thinking about this, Ajay? So we use the quadruplet therapy in most patients. In all the standard risk patients, we use data plus VRD. In the high risk patients, you probably would replace the V with a K, data plus KRD. So, but the NCCN guidelines really have the data plus VRD as a standard approach for uh, standard of care approach for the, the myeloma patients at this point. So how did we get the benefit? So you take the RVD, post-transplant, post-consolidation response rates just from what you saw from the determination trial is in the range of around 33% stringent complete response rates. You get a 10% more stringent complete response rates with a four drug regimen with data to be given uh, in addition to RVD. So Joe clearly points down here, what we know for certain is data plus VRD is a good regimen. What we do not know for certain is, should we continue data to map in the maintenance setting? So I think I, I use most of a quadruplet regimen in most of the patients over the last uh, four years we'd, we'd, we'd started to change our practice. So, uh, Joe, you also talked about the Maya study, uh, Dara RD, which it seems like it's now the most common regimen used in uh, patients who are not going to transplant. It kind of, uh, this update shows a five-year PFS of 52%, which is really amazing to me. I was, that was higher than I expected it was going to be. Any thoughts about this regimen? I hear some people saying they try, you know, they start out with DRD and then some, maybe they think about sneaking in a little PI later. Um, what's your experience with this regimen and do you ever try to bring in a PI after you get it started? A great question, Neil. In fact, I had this conversation just today in clinic. It sounds like everything I did in clinic today is, is coming to fruition in this talk, but, but, but that's just the way it works, right? So, so first of all, I mean, I think the Maya study is remarkable in these long-term outcomes. And I think a lot of it has to do with the continued synergy of giving DARA and lenalidomide together. And just again, you know, tips to the community oncologists, you know, for most of these patients, we're not giving full-dose lenalidomide, right? With time, we, 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 we turn down the decks. You know, I have a 
I had a new hashtag at Ash this year, down with Dex, because uh, Dex is like the booster rockets on the shuttle. Great for the first few cycles, but get the dose down because it really hurts people in the long run. And similarly, most of these people, I have so many patients on the Maya regimen, Neil, that are on, you know, their monthly or every four week daratumumab, and they're taking 10 and sometimes even five milligrams of, of Len uh, three weeks on, one week off. Where I like to squeeze in the PI is potentially in those patients at highest risk, that the high risk patients, even though Maya did demonstrate a benefit in high risk, that may be its slight chink in the armor. So for example, that patient I was referring to today, she has both P53 deletion and translocation 414. So I know that person's at particularly high risk. What I actually do, Neil, instead of bringing it in later, I start them on DVRD, just like Ajay said, and it, assuming no neuropathy, I keep them on the bortezomib for six cycles. And at the end of the six cycles, again, if they don't have neuropathy, what I'll do is I'll turn down the bortezomib to every other week for another six months. Because I think we have previous studies to show to us that patients who are not going to transplant can get a year of a PI without too much toxicity if it's done carefully, subcutaneously, weekly for the first six months, every other week for the next six months. And then they just stay on the daratumumab and lenalidomide indefinitely. And I found that to be particularly helpful because remember in the SWOG study, even just getting six cycles of bortezomib up front had an impact on survival later. So I think those highest risk patients benefit from a PI early on. So speaking of PIs, uh, uh, Jay, you know, particularly during the, um, the COVID, more when COVID was more of a problem, we were thinking about oral therapy and I was hearing a lot of people bringing up the issue of exazimib. We saw some more data from exazimib, uh, Len, and Dex uh, this past year. And uh, Joe's uh, take, even, it was not that many patients, only 42 patients in that. Uh, but Joe's take, and you know, I kind of been hearing this in general over the last few years, is that this is really inferior to bortezomib. Um, not that you should never use it. I'm sure there's situations where you, know, you really need to use an oral therapy. Uh, what's your view about exazimib, Ajay? So exazimib is a, is a PI with an activity, and we had seen it when compared with placebo. So there's no doubt it has activity. But when you compare all the PIs, so if you take the example of carfilzomib, bortezomib, or exazimib, the weakest PI is, is exazimib. The only attractive option here is the the oral intake or the oral administration where the patient does not need to come in as many times as the the patients receiving the PIs, the other PIs do. The second advantage is the the risk of neuropathy is slightly lesser compared to the compared to the bortezomib, may, may be likely to due to the oral, oral administration. So those are the advantages that I see with, with, with ICSA. If I need to use, use a PI, if I understand that the patient is PI sensitive and could be benefit, a, could get a response or a benefit from a PI. So this is, a, this is one of my backup mechanisms, not, not as a frontline mechanism. So we're going to talk about anti-CD 830A therapy in a second. Uh, but question from the uh, chat room, Abdullah, Joe, uh, what about two cycles of a consolidation after transplant as, uh, for example, after the Griffin strategy? Yeah, I think this, it's a great question. Thank you for asking that, Abdullah. I think the short answer is we're incorporating in more and more studies um, some further consolidation after the transplant. Uh, for a few reasons. One, because you know, theoretically, we've always had the sense that maybe the disease is a little bit more sensitive after a transplant. You know, somehow the, the immune system is a bit stunned by the transplant. But also that four cycles isn't really the gold standard. For those of us who have enough gray hair or not enough hair in, in general, can remember the earliest days. Ajay, you were probably still in utero back then, but you know, we would give <laughs> we would give bad, right? Uh, where we would give the vincristine and we would give adriamycin and dexamethasone. And we were concerned about the cardiac toxicity. And that's why we didn't want to use more than four cycles. But I think we're starting to realize that although we have to be careful with the uh, immunomodulatory drugs and stem cell collection, that we can actually go out to six cycles. So my typical approach, Abdullah, is that if someone's received four cycles and they've usually gotten a relatively deep response then and we do a transplant, if they're absolutely in the deepest remission measurable, whether we do MRD or not, let's say they're 
they're in a complete remission, uh, I have a sit in conversation with the patient saying, do we really need to give you more of this consolidation? Maybe we should just go straight to maintenance. But if there is still some residual disease there, uh, I'm of the mind that most people tolerate it well. They've already been through a transplant. So it's not too tough to give them a couple cycles of uh, repeat induction and then going into to maintenance therapy. And so I think that's where most of us are landing now. As we get more studies, we'll know more. But last point is that Griffin did show a deeper um, uh, response after this, those consolidation, that it did actually contribute to the deepening response, although that's a bit diluted by not as many measured it right after transplant. So speaking of depth of response, so now we've seen uh, a phase uh, three study uh, using ESA, ESA-tuximab with RVD, uh, showing an impressive effect on MRD, I think a 50% MRD uh, negativity. Uh, and uh, I guess, Ajay, this, this is uh, uh, Joe's take on uh, this quad. I'm curious, so, you know, I think uh, hopefully we'll get the problem solved. We'll talk about this in a second of sub-Q. Uh, but any thoughts about whether there seems to be any difference in what you're seeing in this phase three trial than what's been seen in Griffin, uh, Ajay? So, in my opinion, both the CD38 antibodies are exactly the same. And the responses that we had seen are almost similar to what we saw with the, with the data VRD with Griffin and the, the GMMG study. So the MR, both of them had one common theme that addition of a CD38 antibody to VRD has resulted in much deeper responses. So that's the take home message I'll go by. So there is a confirmatory phase three trial to Griffin, which is a Perseus that is ongoing. And even in that study, I'm not expecting anything different. So this would be the same exact results that I would go by. So Ajay mentioned the GMMG study, you know, Isotuximab KRD. Uh, Joe, uh, can you uh, comment on what your take is, uh, particularly in terms of, we were talking a little bit before, in terms of quads and higher risk patients and the choice of PI? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I think we we've known from our historical work in relapse disease that carfilzomib is a more potent proteasome inhibitor. I, I think almost everybody would agree that agree to that. Um, I think, like I said earlier, with the evolution of drugs, as we become more comfortable using them to increase their efficacy and reduce their toxicity, I think we found that with carfilzomib. I think we're careful now with the fluid, with the dosing, with the frequency of the dosing. So, so I do think that, in particular, in higher risk patients that. I'm uh, favoring using carfilzomib in the frontline setting. And uh, in fact, I think we can use carfilzomib even in older and more frail patients. We just have to use it uh, a little bit more carefully. Um, I think the other thing that tips us, of course, Neil, is if someone really does have pre-existing neuropathy or if someone has diabetes and is at great risk, um, you know, a lot of our patients can really suffer with neuropathy. So I try to, as much as possible, you know, um, uh, steer away from bortezomib in those settings. What about in the relapse setting, uh, Jay? Uh, again, another study that uh, Joe discusses in his talk, uh, ESA uh, palm dex versus palm dex showing you know, a significant benefit there. And he brings up the question of using CD38 after a patient's had it. So maybe they've had an induction. Would you consider CD38? Would you, if you are, are you going to switch the type of CD38, any comments about, you know, as we use more and more uh, anti-CD38 up front, how it's going to fit in, if at all, in the relapse setting, Ajay? This is a great question, Neil. So the, the study is very important for two reasons. Number one, in the later relapse setting, it, the study showed the addition of a CD38 antibody has resulted in an overall, overall survival. So we have not seen more studies in this space showing that overall survival benefit. So this, this is really good and sobering to see that benefit uh, extended in, the, in this late relapse patients. The second one is I want to differentiate what is, what is exposure versus refractory means. So somebody, we gave examples in the, in the Griffin study, patients would receive data in the upfront setting. And then in the maintenance setting, we, we're not using data at all. So, however, when the patient relapses, we are still able to use the data to map in the relapse setting as well. So these are data exposed patients. Contrary to, the, to that, if somebody is continuously receiving data to map or any CD38 antibody, if they're relapsed, 
on the uh, while receiving the the active CD38 antibody, and the question of whether we can reuse them with combinations to uh, to regain those responses is the biggest question that that I don't know the answer to, and I typically don't do as a as a practice. I'd love to hear Joe's opinion. So Joe, curious also, I'm curious about your thoughts, but also about this other paper. This is maybe my favorite paper that you discuss. I was not aware that there's a sub Q formulation of Isatuximab. It sounds kind of cool. An on body delivery system uh, presented at ASH. Uh, and uh, hear your comments on it. Can you, first of all, maybe uh, give a second opinion uh, in terms of Ajay's approach to uh, using anti CD38 in relapse disease? And then what about the sub Q ESA? And that could be yeah, practice no, changing. <clears throat> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. So in terms of C30, I mean, I agree with, with what Ajay said. I mean, we, we, I actually led the study where we gave um, uh, esotuximab granted as monotherapy in patients who had relapsed recently on a daratumab-based regimen. And these drugs are so similar. They're not designed in a way that one is really going to overcome the resistance of the other. So, so they're so similar. I would not use them sequentially, immediately sequentially. That being said, we know that if someone's off, you know, a CD38 antibody for six months or more, chances are they are going to regenerate some of those CD38 antigens. And so if I had someone in the past, maybe a few relapses ago, treated with DARA or even up front treated with DARA uh, and now they've been you know off a CD38 antibody for a while and I really need a partner for a drug let's say like pomalidomide or other that then I might say okay I'll either go back to the same CD38 or, or maybe there might be a slight advantage of switching to another one like esotuximab and as for ESA sub Q I, I mean I think you're right I mean we've been waiting for this for a while I, I've seen this on delivery uh, on body delivery system it sounds fancier than it might really be but but you you know, it, it really is convenient for the patient. In some countries, this may be able to be done in their homes, uh, at least after initial few doses. Um, so, so I do think with time, one of the biggest reasons now, often we favor DARA over ESA, just to be blunt, is that it's a sub-Q injection. It's a much shorter time frame, even though the ESA infusion is shorter than the DARA infusion used to be. So I think once ESA becomes sub-Q, it'll be a lot easier to uh, toggle between these two or, or, or to you know, uh, not have the delivery method, a big differentiator between the two of them. So I was just kind of flashing OJ around when uh, Daratumab first came out and I was hearing all these stories about people having to be in clinic for 10 hours because of the infusion reaction and the docs go, couldn't keep their offices uh, open long enough. And of course the sub Q completely changed it. This new formulation sounds really interesting. I'd be curious to see like which one, you know, people uh, prefer. Uh, any thoughts about this and what have you observed and how sub-Q DARA has affected the patient's quality of life and experience, Ajay? Absolutely. So within the first month of availability of subcutaneous DARA to MAB, 70% of our patients switched from IV to sub-Q. And the quality of life, uh, the study that we have done, in a, it's a very small study in 100 patients, and the patients loved the sub-Q version of the, of, of the drug. There's only one patient, I don't know why, but there's only one patient that, that did not like it. So where we had to go back to the IV formulation, but overall within the three month time frame, 98% of the patients changed from sub-Q to IV. So now once we, from IV to sub-Q. So once we changed to sub-Q, we didn't know how much time to monitor and how much time we needed to see after the first dose including after giving the pre-medications. So we watched for a, our data for a period of one and a half year. And recently we said, even that monitoring for the first three hours after giving that sub-Q formulation, even after the first dose is not even necessary. So we changed our practice accordingly. So right now our patients go in five minutes of getting the shot, waiting for the lapse is the longest period that it takes, and then they go home. So we go from uh, first gear to second gear here. We're going to talk about CAR T therapy in a second. I want uh, Ajay to talk about this uh, paper presented at ASH, uh, uh, looking at IDASEL and uh, MRD. But but first, Joe, can you provide sort of an overview of where we are in terms of clinical use of CAR T? Uh, so we have two approved uh, preparations in IDASEL and Siltacel. 
I'm curious what your take is nowadays, Joe, in terms of the relative efficacy and tolerability issues and other practical issues. Uh, and also what the situation is right now in terms of actually being able to access CAR T because it seems like it's a huge problem and really it's just the question of trying to get either preparation rather than even having a preference. Any general comments? I, I, you made you made the key point, uh, Neil. It really is. It's access, access, access. You know, I'm not I'm not making light of it, but it was like in the middle of the pandemic, you didn't care what toilet paper you found. You just wanted to find toilet paper, right? I mean, Costco had sold out, and you're you're spending ridiculous amounts of money getting it. Again, I'm not trying to make light of a serious topic, but you know, it really is still very hard to get slots for CAR T. Uh, and, and now I'm sure we're going to get to buy specifics later, e even more so with buy specifics right now. And so, yes, there does seem to be there are relative differences, of course, between Idacel and Siltacel, both in efficacy and in their toxicity profile. But right now, I think if if a patient is CAR T eligible, I'd be happy to get them either one of them, if you will. It's not like I favor one so much over the other um, that we're in a, in a position to choose um, in, in that way. I think in the long run we'll have more choices, and frankly, in the long run, like. Like with every other drug, we're going to find ways to make it more effective. Um, so right now, unfortunately, there are a lot of people waiting for CAR-T. I think we have gone through a bit of evolution where it used to be that we kind of saved CAR-T for someone who has literally had nothing else. It was like the Hail Mary pass. I think we've realized that's probably not the best stewardship of that resource, and we want to use it appropriately, and each center is finding a way to do that more effectively. I think we're going to see more CAR-T availability over this next year as some of the supply chain issues uh, resolve as more patients, as, sorry, more centers are coming on board. But it's going to take a while, Neil. It's not going to be available overnight. So, Ajay, let's talk a little bit about this ASH paper looking at MRD and IDASL. Can you talk a little bit about what they looked at there and what you think it means? Yeah. So, Bruno Paiva's group, who are pioneers in the next generation flow from, from, from Europe, so they were able to look at the samples from the patients that received uh, that received the CAR T as a IDASL as a part of the CARMA 2 trial. So there were 128 patients that got in, that enrolled in the CARMA trial. There were samples that were obtained for these 125 patients. What they were able to see is four time points at month one, month three, month six, and month 12. They looked at the MRD negativity rates. They looked at the serological responses. This is to define what is the impact, the prognostic impact of attaining an MRD negativity? So the first question that they asked is like, is there any concordance between the next generation flow, next gen generation sequencing is one better than the other? So there was significant concordance of greater than 65% across all the group, the highest concordance at, at this month six at more than 80%. Contrary to what they were looking for in terms of the good prognostic impact, they found that if patients did not achieve an MRD negativity at 10 to the power of minus six at month one. So that came with a high negative prognostic impact. So patients who had MRD positivity at month one, the median PFS was two months versus MRD negativity at 10 to the power of minus six, the median PFS was 11.5 months. So there is utility for using MRD negativity at month one here this is, this is an early prognostic marker suggesting a negative impact if the patient is MRD positive. The second thing that they looked at was if the patients achieved greater than a CR and MRD negativity, both of them happening simultaneously at month three, six, and 12, they're the ones that tend to be the long-term good players. The third one is the reappearance of normal plasma cells. They talked about when the normal plasma cells come back, this is overcoming what, this, what the CAR-T functionality is, what the CAR-T persistence is. So that provided a negative impact. So patients progress a little early when that happens. So those are the three take home messages that I, 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 I could give from this paper. So sometimes I wonder if I'm the last person to hear about stuff, but I thought that thing <laughs> about the normal uh, plasma cells was really cool, and I, I hadn't heard about it previously. Uh, Joe, you were talking about the issue of when CAR-T fits, and of course we saw this press release. We're waiting to see the data from Karma 3 uh, using it earlier. Uh, any thoughts about when we're going to see this data and how you think it's going to affect practice? Right now, having to wait for four lines of therapy seems really late. 
I kind of wonder, are we, you think we, I mean, by specifics now are going to complicate it even more. So it depends on you know, which one comes first, by specifics or CAR T. But to me, like if you're resistant to PI, IMID, and anti CD38, I'm not sure how much more longer you want to wait for at least one of those two. I completely agree. And, and I think, I think it's going to happen. I think in light of the discussion we had earlier about drug approval, the standard is going to be higher. I mean, thankfully, CAR T has shown such tremendous response even in these earlier phases. And, you know, it's interesting, their whole series even presented ASH at, you know, looking at people, for example, who had relapsed within 18 months of starting therapy, you know, that highest risk people, uh, highest risk patient, e even phenotypically. So when we're going to hear, I think it's going to take a little bit longer, Neil, because we're going to see the readout on this. But, you know, the FDA is going to appropriately set a higher bar for when we're going to bring is the, the number of patients eligible, the potential use of it, as you've said, especially now we're using more quads. So people are going to have, you know, there could be triple class refractory after two lines of therapy now. Um, and so so I think there is a justification using it earlier, even biologically, because I think the T cells, when they're a little less beaten down, um, you know, these soldiers are not at the end of their career. They're earlier on. We may be able to, to engage them for longer. Uh, and then lastly, as you sort of indicated, I know we're going to come to bispecifics. You know, we always get asked the question, is it going to be CAR T? Is it going to be bispecifics? My favorite answer to almost every question is all of the above, right? And that's what we want. We, we want them both because some people are going to be better suited for CAR-T. Some people are be better suited and more available for, for bispecifics. I think the major hurdle bispecifics will have to come over is really being able to fully give it in the community and not to have, you know, step up dosing in an academic center. If we can figure that out, then it's going to be much, much more accessible. And I think more and more patients are going to benefit from these therapies much earlier in the disease course. But I think of using CAR-T in, you you know, one to three prior lines, that's probably not going to happen this calendar year. But, you know, I'm happy to be surprised if, if it happens, uh, because it, it is going to take a little while to fully prove that. So Ajay also in his talk goes through the more recent data on Siltacel, the other approved CAR-T product. I also want to ask you about this uh, CAR-T that targets GPRC5D, which we're going to talk about in a second, is also the target of a, of a bi-specific. Anything you want to say, Ajay, about uh, where things stand with uh, that agent? Uh, seems very interesting. Uh, what, what's been seen so far is a different target for CAR-T. It is a different target. So this is heavily expressed on, this is a, expressed on the myeloma cells and the hard keratinized tissues. So the, the side effect profile that you see with this specific agent could be slightly different than the BCMA targeted therapies. So the infection, potential or the infection risk is much lower by targeting this agent. Number two, the skin related changes and the dysgeusia are the taste and the change, uh, the change in the taste were the two common side effects that were seen. So other than that, at the five dose cohorts that were evaluated all the way from 25 million cells to 450 million cells, you're able to see the MTD has not exceeded. And typically for patients who have received more than 100 million cells, the overall response rate was 100%. So this is again, early data, early snapshot of 33 patients. And among patients that had seen a prior BCMA directed therapy, the overall response rate are beyond the 80% mark. So all of this suggests that this drug could be uh, could definitely be expanded, developed, and with minimal toxicities. Uh, Joe, any thoughts about the uh, skin uh, dysgeusia and nail changes? I think it's also seen with the bispecific, where I kind of wonder how that's going to play out since that maybe is going to be longer-term therapy. I guess a reminder that CAR T is not necessarily only going to have CRS and neurologic toxicity. How much of an issue do you think these other problems uh, are gonna be with this uh, target? Yeah, I mean, I think we're learning there's no perfect target, right? I mean, you trade off maybe, as Ajay said, a little bit less infection for some of these other issues. Um, I, I do think that that we're going to get better at managing it. I think we already are now compared to where we were six months ago. I mean, look, Neil, where we were a year ago in CRS and where we are now. 
right, in terms of both preventing it and managing it. So I'm not I'm not belittling it because I've had some patients who really struggle. I mean, the dyskesia is no fun, and some people with their hair changes and nail changes, it mean, it can be in their view very disfiguring. And so we have to. I don't want to minimize that, but I think we are going to get better at managing it, both preventing it with the right dosing and the dosing strategies, and also we're learning about some interventions that may be able to help. So I think it's going to be a factor, but I think the 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 benefit of having a different target, as we see now that although we can go BCMA to BCMA, it's preferable to go to a different target. I think that benefit is going to outweigh some of these risks and we're going to get better at managing them. So kind of takes me a lot to get excited, but I'm getting pretty excited about bispecific, <laughs> not just in myeloma, but uh, also <laughs> lymphoma. And actually, it's interesting, uh, Jay, I was actually doing an interview of a patient who was on to had been on teclistamab for a year and a half on a trial the day the drug was approved doing great no sense i was just like what a great endorsement of be participating in clinical research but uh, it's approved uh on docs in practice are asking are we going to be given this in the near future can you kind of summarize what we know in terms of efficacy tolerability and the very important practical question of how are community-based general medical oncologists going to be involved in the delivery of bispecifics? That's great. So, Neil, the, this was one of the one of the things that excited me as well. So, because you're able to, you're waiting for so long for these CAR Ts, and having the ability to to get an off-the-shelf agent that gives almost similar response rates and, and the similar benefit, this is really this was really promising for me. So the picklist map was approved in October of this year. So basically, based on the Majestic 1 trial that showed that treated 165 patients, and the drug is given subcutaneously, and the drug is given as priming doses for two doses before patients get the target dose, uh, which is the first dose. So the REMS program that was designed for this, for this specific agent is means that every every patient should be admitted in the hospital for 48 hours after receiving the first priming dose and the second priming dose and the first dose. So why do we do that? So there is risk of CRS that was seen predominantly in the in the first three doses, the two priming doses and the first dose. And to minimize that that risk, this uh, this risk evaluation in the mitigation program has been incorporated. So. After that, the patient could be receiving the drug as an outpatient once a week. And as Joe suggested, we potentially can make our own changes down the line. But at this point, it is approved on a, on a, on a weekly basis. So what did we see in terms of the adverse events when it, when it was given at, at the priming doses and the scheduled doses on a weekly basis? There was significant increased risk of infections that we alluded to before. So the grade three risk of infections was in the range of around 40%. So that is not a small number. So now that we're incorporating a lot of prophylaxis, antibiotic prophylaxis, giving IVIG for these patients, we expect to see those numbers to drop down drastically. Using that antiviral prophylaxis, antibacterial prophylaxis, and antifungal prophylaxis as well, as well as PJP prophylaxis for these patients, at least until, until the time we, we, are, we are much safer and, and we're able to space this drug is, is much crucial as we see. Coming to your last point of how can we see this roll out into the community? So at this point of time, as a commercial agent, we are getting our hands wet. So we're getting our feet wet, we're getting, get, getting used to giving this drug in the hospital for the for the first month or two, and once the, once that first few months are completed, we'll safely be able to hand over this patient to to the community. So at this point of time, where the community has not seen uh, management of CRS firsthand, this probably would be the best idea. But as Joe suggested, six months down the line, we are fast learners, and we are, we had we had seen lots of changes, and when we soon can see this. Uh, happening in the community. So, uh, Joe, um, Ajay also went through uh, some other uh, bispecifics in his talk, uh, ABV 383, uh, and also alnuctamab. Um, any thoughts about bispecifics in general? At this point, can you differentiate 
anything about them in terms of efficacy, tolerability? And again, your projection and, you know, what are we going to be talking about a year from now, a year in review, uh, 2023 in terms of buy specifics, Joe? Yeah, no, I, I think there, there are, you know, 18 ways to cut this pie. I, I've kept it pretty simple. I like to say right now, we really have three different, sorry, I should say four different buy specifics. Number one, the BCMA directed buy specifics. And whether it's uh, teclistimab, L-ratinab, ABBV, uh, to be honest, they're very similar. They have response rates somewhere between 60 and 70 percent. Um, we can make some differentiations based on how frequently they're given, but re realistically, and the Regeneron product, but realistically right now, it seems they're very similar in terms of CRS infections. Uh, again, some differences based on step-up dosing and how much time people spend in hospital, let's say with L-Ratinab, because you will be discussing that next year, because that may be the next BCMA um, directed uh, by specific that will be approved. Category two are the GPRC5Ds like talquetamab that you have up here. You'll be talking about this next year, Neil, because it may likely be approved in this calendar year. Um, and we've talked already a bit about how it targets the cell differently and has different toxicities. The third category would be those that target FCRH5, which are a little bit further behind, although they've been there for a while, so we may not see them approved this year. Um, uh, if you're doing your year in review for 2024, you may be talking about FCRH5. And then for your year in review 24, or maybe even 2025, the final category are NK cell engagers, so natural killer cell engagers, as opposed to T cell engagers as bispecifics. And the Neil, Neil, why I want to emphasize that, you know, I just started a patient today on, uh, I think we're on the ninth cohort of our NK engager study, and and it's amazing. She's being treated exclusively as an outpatient. So the risk of CRS is so low, these patients actually don't have to be admitted for um, their treatment. And that's going to be much more, I think, feasible to bring into the community. Now, granted, they may not have the same efficacy as the T-cell engagers based on the functioning of an NK cell, uh, but I think there's a lot of hope for the future. So I would differentiate them based on what is their target, both on the myeloma cell and on the, the uh, immune cell into those four categories. But you're going to be talking and buy specifics, buy specifics, buy specifics for the next several years, boss. Nine K, NK cells. I haven't heard that one before. Here's the talcletum. I just want to point out, I have a list of favored trial names with Glow, Cleopatra, but I like this one, Monumental One. That's optimistic. Well, let me Anyhow. tell you, our, 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 NK, our NK one is the Trinket study with ah, the NK nice. in the middle being drinking and not bad. Oh, cool. I like it. I like it. All right. Cell mods. AJ, you know, we've been, to me, I feel like we've been hearing about cell mods forever. Like, where are they? And of course you and remember, you've done a lot of work on that. Ibertamide. We saw uh, some more data this year uh, on, on that uh, fascinating agent. Uh, I don't know if you call this Mezzi, but you know, another uh, Cerebron E3 ligase modulator or cell mod. Any comments about these uh, uh, agents? What's your experience been, Ajay? So both the ibadamide as well as the mesigdamide. So these are cell mods, the cerebellum E3 ligase modulators. They bind to cerebellum at much, much higher affinity than what you see with the, with the palmalidamide and the lenalidamide. What we're able to see was these, these can be in among, among these patients that are pentarefractory, that had seen five prior lines of therapy, and you're, you're still able to see with an oral agent, you're able to see response rates in the range of 30% or, or beyond. So the toxicity, when you look at these specific agents, this is easily manageable, and the toxicities are mostly neutropenia and hematological toxicities, and potentially the way that I see this is these could be used as either combination treatments or as maintenance treatments down the line. When we, when we, when we want to develop post-CAR-T maintenance, this could, be, this could be potentially as a, a, a viable agent in this space. Joe, any thoughts? And also, I thought this is interesting, the impact in extramedullary disease. I don't know why it would work better there, but, you know, 31% response rate. Any thoughts about where uh, cell mods are heading, Joe? Yeah, no, I, I think Ajay captured it nicely. I mean, despite all the excitement of the big, potent, you know, uh, 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 CAR-T cell therapies and biospecifics, 
<clears throat> they're very involved and they're t and they're going to be challenging to give. Uh, I mean, these are perhaps some of the most tolerated agents we've ever had in myeloma. So thinking about uh, the fact that still the majority of patients with myeloma are over the age of 65. You know, we have a lot of frail patients that, that are not going to be able to experience some of these novel treatments. So being able to have these, I think they're going to make their way earlier. You know, as, as Ajay mentioned, we have both ibertamide and mazigdamide, which are likely ultimately going to be the replacements for lenalidomide and pomalidomide. So they're going to prove themselves in this relapse space by themselves. They're going to be used in combination and they're going to be brought earlier in the disease course. And I think uh, they're going to fit into those niches uh, that we're all going to still have, as, as you've mentioned, with these patients becoming progressive on uh, immunomodulatory drugs. <clears throat> I'm not totally convinced with the extramedullary disease yet. I think people define that in different ways and it's a bit more broad category. I'm not trying to naysay it, Neil. I'm just saying I think we have a little bit more time to to make that deep conclusion. I just thought it was really cool. I haven't heard about that. Mm -hmm. So Selenexer, lots of questions from docs in practice about how to give it. You know, they try it once and they have problems with it. Ajay reviewed uh, this uh, paper uh, looking at Selenexer called Frilzimib uh, dexamethasone. Uh, Joe, uh, what's your experience with Selenexer and what do you think about this regimen? I got to tell you, I use Selly every day in the clinic. I, I think this is an extraordinary agent. You know, Ajay and I have written papers about this short version. This drug should be given weekly. This drug is actually probably best given at 60 or 80 milligrams weekly, uh, either whether it's by itself or in combination with just about everything else. My favorite partner is Carfilzomib, like you've shown in this paper. And key things to remember, the worst month is the first month. So it's really important in that first month that patients get that two-fold antiemetics. I give them a 5-HT3 antagonist and, and a lanzapine, and I find that that helps with both the sort of stomach nausea and head nausea, as I call it. We hydrate them. We, we make sure we get them through that first month, and then the drug is much more tolerable. And now the drug is showing that it can partner with, with bortezomib, carfilzomib, Filzomib, pomalidomide, daratumab, and all four of those now are listed on NCCN. And of course, this is the Boston study that preceded that carfilzomib study. Got a lot of people thinking about using it with a, in a partnership with uh, bortezomib. Uh, Jay, again, what's your thought, you know, particularly in terms of quality of life? Are most patients able to, you know, have a good quality of life? And I mean, do you see responses the way Joe's just described? Absolutely. I think when you're, when you're looking at how to deliver the treatment, as, as Joe clearly emphasized, how to deliver the drug is the most important thing here. Once a week delivery at 60 milligrams in combinations, 80 milligrams in, uh, with, with, with DEX, but my go-to regimen is that 60 milligrams, if you're giving once a week, along with botasmib once a week, you're able to see those responses in the long run. In the Boston trial, there is a clear PFS benefit that was seen favoring the combination. So uh, final paper, and when I saw the title of this one, I was like, ah, yeah, I like this idea. So, oops, sorry, went the wrong way. So, uh, Venetoclax, Joe, uh, lots of interest in that, particularly, of course, in 1114. We've been through that whole story over the last couple of years. But Venetoclax and Diratumumab index kind of sounds like a good quality of life uh, uh, approach. Uh, looks like pretty decent uh, response to it. Any thoughts about this ASH paper? Yeah, no, I, I think we're going to see a significant surge of venetoclax in this calendar year. Uh, probably late in the year, we may even see it approved in patients with transcation 1114. And like with everything else, it should be able to be partnered. Both the efficacy signal and the concerning safety signal um, is, is, is pointing us in the direction of using this only in patients with transcation 1114, but it is feasible to combine. I've combined it with DARE. I've combined it with carfilzomib. I've combined it with bortezomib. Uh, and so in that subset of patients, and this is a reminder, um, when patients are diagnosed with myeloma and even at relapse, if it wasn't carefully done the first time, get the FISH analysis. See if patients are transcation 1114, because this is a great option for these patients. Maybe it's only 10, 15% of the total of our patients, maybe slightly higher than that, but maybe it's not a massive percentage, but it's a significant percentage. And it is more common within the African-American population. So it is, I think, worthy for us to get this information because I have so many patients that are taking this oral therapy and they're doing really well without having you know, significant toxicity. 
So final comment from AJ Nicholas in the chat room wants to know, do you need to be concerned about tumor lysis syndrome? I'll add in how much of an issue is cytopenias and in general, what's your experience been? What line of therapy, uh, Jay, and what kind of combination do you generally use? So I'll, I'll answer the first question. So line of therapy, we usually use if somebody has 11, 14, even, even as a second line therapy. We have not used it as a front line, but early relapse, we have used the venetoclax in patients with translocation 11, 14. So our institution has, has expertise to look for the ex vivo testing to look for the sensitivities. So that really helps us from a basic science perspective. So coming to the question of the tumor lysis, it's very clear that unlike the CLL experience, unlike the other experiences, we don't see the tumor lysis in myeloma. So we had been extremely careful about you know, watching those initial weeks with, with starting at the lower doses. This does not need a ramp up. We go with 400 milligrams to start with, after month one, we go double it to 400 BID. So this does not need a ramp up, but for the reinforcement for that, that we are doing the right thing for the patient, I typically bring the patient after 48 to 72 hours after starting the 400 milligram dosing, and I'd never seen a tumor lysis uh, with venetoclax in myeloma. So Ajay and uh, Joe, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Everybody learned so much. Audience, thank you for attending. Come on back tomorrow night. We'll see what Dr. Piotrowska and Dr. Raleigh have to say about lorlatinib, first line in ALK, uh, KRAS G12C, and the role of TDXD in lung cancer. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Joe. Thanks, Ajay. Thank you. Thank you.